Well, good evening. And I would like to welcome you to Mongolia Matters, my program about Mongolia, which to me very much matters. Um, I am the host of your show, and my name is Sylvia Lefton. I had the privilege of staying in Mongolia and serving as an English teacher for the span of a decade. Tonight, I have um, some special guests at my table, and the occasion is Sagansar, which is Mongolian New Year. Um, I am very pleased to uh, share with you that on this occasion, uh, we have three people, actually, that have served in the country tonight. One of them will be Judy Gates, who um, is in the Red Hunt Huts, and she served through Peace Corps for a couple of years and then went back. Um, we have another young woman who will be back in a few minutes, and her name is Rachel, and she was in Mongolia, actually, at the same time as I was. That would be Rachel Luce. And um, she and I did some programming together at um, various places for the benefit of the students who needed to learn English. Um, my guests at this Sagansar dinner on the 18th of February are John uh, Jack, likes to be called Jack, and his wife Elaine, the Pennies. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Sylvia. Thank you for inviting us. My pleasure. And they made it possible, they and many other people, for me to be able to serve in Mongolia. So they're very special, and they continue to have an interest in Mongolia. Um, Judy Gates, who is the woman I was just telling you about in the red, um, we would call it a vest. I think it's a hantat, so I stand to be corrected. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here and meet Sylvia and the other guests. And I won't tell you her age, but we are very close within a couple of weeks of being the same age. And then we have the person who actually was the go-between me and Judy because I never knew about this precious woman until my neighbor John from uh, downstairs in my senior apartment complex kept saying to me, have you met the Mon woman who's been to Mongolia? And I kept saying, oh, no, I'd really love to meet her. And, John, how many times did you give me the phone number? <laughs> Quite a few, Sylvia. And you're like me. I write notes to myself and put them in my pocket, and I pull them out months later, and I don't know who the notes is about. So we finally got the phone number, and you got connected with Judy. Which is why we're all here tonight. And John's wife would have come, but she has a dental issue that she's dealing with, so we miss her and uh, look forward to another time when we can all get together again. Now, um, as we were sitting here having a dinner, which is not at all a Mongolian dinner, I might add, uh, and maybe some um, details about that will come up later, but I would like to uh, start with a story that Judy was telling at the table, and I just didn't want to miss it. So, um, Judy, perhaps I will give you this microphone, and you can tell us your story and anything else you want to tell us. Well, perhaps I should start by the last question that we were just saying as uh, do, do Mongolians have cows, I think you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, Mongolians, it's a uh, nomadic society. They're herders and, and they uh, have a number of animals uh, that, that are domesticated. Um, and they actually are called the five snouts. And so that includes uh, cattle, uh, and that yaks are con considered cattle, goats, sheep, horses, and camels. Mm -hmm. And you will find all of those all over Mongolia. The they, uh, people, some of the herders, some have different combinations, but generally they at least have sheep and goats and, and uh, horses. And the traditional diet, as you can imagine, since they're nomadic people and they move often by the season to find fresh pasture for their animals, uh, they uh, don't stay in one place long enough to grow things. So their diet for long, long, long time is uh, meat and milk products. And we were talking before about, uh, for the milk products, they have to, um, they'll 
use the milk as, uh, in different ways, including trying to keep it for longer periods. So they'll have regular milk, they'll make yogurt, they'll make uh, it's kind of a curds, uh, a little bit like a cottage cheese. They'll have something called orum, which is kind of the cream part they use in different ways. They'll, um, they make um, uh, something called arrow, which is sort of dried curds, and uh, that is actually kept to be used in the um, pretty much year round. So um, that's that's how they use the arrow. The uh, one other thing that I mean, sorry, the milk, but the one other thing we were just talking about is is cheese, and they do make cheese. And I was telling about the first time I had some of this cheese, and it looked like cheese, and it had the texture of cheese. And so, and I really like cheese. <laughs> the stronger, the better. So I took a bite of this and chewed it and discovered that it had no flavor, nothing, zero. So that's a little discouraging if you like strong cheese, but that's the way it was. Now, um, I would just add that um, I did meet someone at some point who had uh, uh, had been helped in making cheese by someone who was from the Netherlands. And as you can imagine, they told, ex helped them learn how to make cheese that had a little flavor in it. And uh, periodically when I was in Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital, I didn't live there, but when I came into town, a friend knew this man who was from this northern area who came down to sell some of his products on a weekly basis. And so that's where I got to get real cheese once in a while, but it was rarely available. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what brought you to Mongolia and what you continue to do as you go back? Uh, well, when I, um, I've i always been involved in my community in one way or the other, but uh, had a career, raised a family. When my husband passed on, I thought, why not maybe spread your wings a little bit? Peace Corps was founded when I was in college, and it wasn't the right time then for me, but... Uh, uh, back in now, what was it, 2007 maybe, I began to think about, re think again about Peace Corps, and so I applied and uh, was um, accepted, and it, at that time, usually takes about a year, actually, to go through all the application and the interviews and the examinations and all the things you have to do, so... Um, at some point, they do say to you, "Is there some place in the world you'd kind of like to go?" And uh, at that, uh, I thought about it a little bit, and then I just said, "You know, I n you never know what you're turning down." So I said, "Send me where you want to send me. Ask me to do what you want me to do." And as I like to say it, and I'm sure Sylvia agrees. They sent me to the best country on earth yeah, and in Mongolia. You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, I still remember my children's uh, uh, reaction when I told them that's where I was going, and they'd been so supportive up to that point. But when I said Mongolia, gotten the official invitation, they said, now wait a minute, Mom, you know, <laughs> let's check this one out. And uh, But I went off and had actually ended up spending three years there, and I go back each summer. I was a business volunteer, so I tried to help small businesses in different ways, although in the Peace Corps you do everything. And then uh, I had made so many good friends who are now like family to me, so I... Uh, I little different projects that are now on my own. I'm not part of Peace Corps anymore, but I go back for a month. And one of the things this last summer, one of my Mongolian friends and I were able to institute a little, what we called our summer kindergarten. It was uh, where a group of herders uh, have their, what they call their summer grazing grounds and only use it during the summer. And 
It's a beautiful, beautiful area, way, way, way out in the countryside. Um, and of course, their families, they're there, and they're, their homes, are, which are called gares, the felt tents, you know, they take them with them, and their communities out there for that for a couple of months. And so um, we were able to set up anyway a little school and had teachers, and I brought things from here, supplies, and uh, um, it went very, very well. And so actually we're going to try and do it again this year. What kinds of supplies did you bring? Well, uh, I brought s certainly uh, some things I got there, paper and, you know, uh, drawing stuff. I uh, brought some books, the simpler English books for children that I uh, got through our library's book sale uh, and that people also gave me. And um, some, some simple kind of games. Um, I also brought a bunch of puppets. Somebody's yard sale had a bunch of wonderful puppets that I took with me. Um, I also discovered an uh, organization called Didax, which uh, supplies school kinds of manipulative things uh, for simple counting and so forth, and they very generously donated a few things. So, um, so we had a nice variety of things to use, and I uh, was very grateful for the help and for being able to do it. May I ask you if you were going to um, focus on one experience in Mongolia that you had that stands out above all the rest, whether it was a shocking thing to you or a surprise or happy or amazing. Do you have some kind of um, recollection of a thing that you'd like to share that um, would be important for us to hear? It's hard to focus on, to single out any one thing since every day brought so many new friends and interesting things. I do have a little story. Do I have enough time oh, to absolutely. tell you a couple of minutes? Yes. Because some things, and I think partly it's the atmosphere you feel in Mongolia. It has such a wonderful history. It says uh, Mongolian people know the stories, the songs, the, the history. They, they, they hold on to that fortunately, those traditions. And uh, and so you sort of feel there's something special going on sometimes. But one day, uh, uh, I don't think I mentioned how cold it can get in Mongolia. It's very, it has what they call a continental climate. It can get down to 40, 50 below in the winter, and it's, it's really cold. So um, when you go outdoors in the winter, even when you're inside, because I had a little wood stove and that was it, um, you you bundle up with everything you possibly can put on. And one day I uh, uh, was going out to go to work. I had to walk. I worked in a little chamber of commerce, and it was about half a mile, I guess. And there weren't of course, many people around. Nobody wants to stay outside very long. And I had just left my home and saw a little boy, maybe about 10, 11, coming towards me. And he was about the only, he was the only person on the street at that point. But as he got closer, I could see he had a coat, certainly he had a hat on, but his little jacket was open at the neck and he had no scarf. And you probably know, scarf is really nice to have. <laughs> And um, we kind of smiled, and I walked on by, but all I could see, think of was how cold he must be without a scarf. And, and I, I just was at past him only a few steps, and I stopped and turned to look back at him. And for whatever reason, at that instant, he turned and looked at me. And I said, gestured him to come over. And I took my scarf that I was wearing and I wrapped it around his neck and got his coat up tighter. And he sort of bewildered by it and but said something which I really didn't understand, probably what are you doing, crazy lady, or something like that. And then we went our separate ways. What was interesting <clears throat> about that is that uh, 
uh, you often wore, I often would wear a scarf to bed at night because it's really cold. And that morning, apparently, I'd never taken off the scarf to bed. I wore to bed, and I added an extra one when I went out. Yeah. So I realized it only after I'd given him my scarf. And it reminded me, and you may remember this better than I, there's a Christmas hymn of the a boy walking in the footsteps and he who will bless others will find himself blessed. Mm -hmm. That's the gist of it. And mm -hmm. I obviously mm -hmm. couldn't help thinking, yep, that was supposed to be. Yeah, how beautiful mm -hmm. is that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your sharing. Now, um, I have another person here who has just put her little baby to bed, and she's back with us. And this is Rachel Luce, and she and I had the, I had the privilege of being with her at the same time in Mongolia. And um, I would like to hear from you about some of the, um, well, what brought you there, and then some of the things that stand out in your mind that you would like to share. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let's see. I, I went to Mongolia on three different occasions. The first one, twice it was teaching English, and the middle time was actually studying abroad because I was a college student. And after I had gone to Mongolia the first time, um, I was kind of baffled that I could have an opportunity to return because I, I really wanted to travel for a semester during college. And um, anyways, it was very uh, surprising to me to see that there were programs that would take you to Mongolia. And my major was anthropology, so it was right up my alley to study another culture. Um, I, I really, I loved the people there. They were very welcoming and very eager to learn English, um, very eager to engage with me. Um, I, I remember having even taxi car drivers asking to learn English. Mm -hmm. You probably have that experience mm -hmm. too. It's like, um, I need to get out now and go to bed, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, still a delight to feel welcomed, um, for the most part as a foreigner. And, um, and my husband and I drove here from upstate New York today and, um, He's not with us this evening, unfortunately, because he spent a few more years in Mongolia than I did. Um, but we were trying to remember different uh, occasions that we celebrated the event we're here tonight for, um, the Lunar New Year at Tagansar. And I remember a couple of my teacher um, colleagues inviting me over for the Lunar New Year. And that was a very special occasion because it was the first night it's usually a three night celebration and I think in the countryside it was longer I don't know if you ladies remember well in the countryside anything can be longer than okay they make up on when they're done sure <laughs> <laughs> like that uh but the first night they would celebrate with uh relative with immediate family right. and the oldest patriarch mm -hmm. would be the hosting family member and then the second night, you would visit other family members, not as not in your immediate household. And the third night, you would visit friends. And people would be visiting all during the days. But actually, to be invited in as a foreigner with, um, with the head of our English department and then another teacher colleague, I felt very um, privileged and, um, you know, kind of taken into their circles because I had heard that Mongolians... Um, you know, kind of kept the same tight-knit group of friends uh, from their their class at school. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me like a very um, just endearing, open-arm welcome. Um, and and I loved learning the different customs from the the New Year and and the other holiday in the summer. Um, it, it was interesting. Uh, some of the other young, the young men would kind of compete with each other to see who could eat the most of the dumplings at the Lunar New Year. They would make um, hundreds of boats, the dumplings, and uh, put them out on their balcony because, of course, it was so cold, they didn't need, um, need to use a refrigerator or freezer. They could just put them outside 
and prepare for, I don't know how long, maybe at least a week, maybe weeks in advance mm-hmm. for this huge celebration. Um, I, yeah, I think that's it. I, it was a, a wonderful time to, to live there and serve there. And, um, I hope I get to go back again. My husband gets to go back this summer and I don't, but hopefully in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I'll respond to a memory I have in Mongolia because I have a very, um, very, to me, special memory that I will always treasure. Um, what I remember is the uh, family that actually the woman that is one of the family members I met first was the uh, direct the um, manager of the office at one of the NGOs that I served first. And so I became like one of the family. Like you said, it's just so endearing to be accepted and brought into the family. And I communicate with them to this day. But um, they had been touched by a miracle, actually. And this um, is like provable. It really happened um, very many years before. Uh, they had a um, visit by one of the people who came to serve in Mongolia. I believe, I don't know if he was an actual pastor, but he certainly had a deep spiritual um, ability to communicate on a deep level with people, and he had a gift of healing. Um, Not that he did the healing, obviously God heals, but um, he um, noticed that a little child was sitting on the floor and she couldn't get up and the family explained that the reason she couldn't get up is because her hip or something was out of place or something very bad was going on there and so she couldn't walk and so he said do you mind if i pray and so the family said well sure and um a good percentage of people in mongolia are either buddhists or um some maybe secular buddhists some very deeply committed Buddhist, but anyway, um, this man happened to be um, a Christian, and he said, um, I would like to pray. So he prayed, and he, as he was praying, he actually laid his hand on the hip, and all of a sudden, the little child began to scream and writhe, and it was amazing, and all of a sudden, there was a lot of heat from the hip, and it actually um, got a little bit red, and all of a sudden, she stopped crying, And they put her down, and within a short period of time, she was walking. And so when I heard about that, it was like, wow. You know, we hear that miracles happen, but I don't know how many people. It probably happen all over the place, and we just don't notice. I believe that's true. But here is a a thing that happened within a family. And so um, I was moved by that. So anyway, fast forward many years um, after that, um, the mother, who was about my age, um, and her husband were so very deeply moved by what had happened that they became believers and active in their uh, congregation. Um, At one point, um, when I was there, um, after I'd been there for several years, the parents actually went down to, um, I believe it was Sanchen. It was uh, down in the Gobi Desert in the southern part of Mongolia. And um, they decided that they would like to share with the people that they knew, their family, from many of them, and friends, what um, this faith was all about in the deepest way, because they had not only experienced it, but then they had come to study and grew in the faith and really believe that they should share that. So they did. And that year, um, Sagansa came, and they stayed in, in the Gobi Desert to continue being sent ones, if you will. So um, being the fact that I was the same age as their mom, I think one of the kids called me Badoon Lady. Uh, oh, Badoon Baby. Actually, that means fat baby. <laughs> but they laugh about people that are heavy because they don't have all that amount of food, so therefore they don't have the opportunity probably to get fat. But anyway, I I find that very funny, and it makes me, I've got a lot of fat stories, because you know what, they really don't mean harm by it, it's just how it is culturally, they're very different. But anyway, to get back to my story, um, the family um, decided that they would like for me to be the visited person that year, the oldest person gets um, the honor on that night, and older people always get honor in Mongolia, it's just wonderful, but um, they chose to come to my home, and they did the Mongolian greeting, which is to um, take 
their hands and cup their palm of their hand under the elbow of the older person. So, of course, I got many people cupping their hands because I was the oldest person. And what they do is they give a gift of money. Now, for a, a very impoverished country, for me, an American, to get money was very humbling because you don't really want to take money from people, but you know this is what the tradition dictates. So they slipped me this money. They did that greeting, and um, we proceeded to have a, a dinner. Now, I must admit, I didn't make the boards, which is the um, dumpling it's made with sheep meat, but I did have my lasagna, which I served tonight. For me, that's my Mongolian traditional sagansar, but this is how um, I did it, and they loved it. But um, it just really touched me that their, their parents were out serving others, and they were honoring me and coming to my home and having this special meal. And um, I will show some slides later on in the show or at some point. And um, one thing that stands out in my mind is the bove, which is a um, f kind of bread, and it's in the shape of an oval. And um, they make sure that it's an odd number because that has a good luck kind of connotation. And then another thing I remember about um, and I'll show you a picture of that later, um, that I remember is you had to make sure that you taught only good things on New Year's because if you said anything negative, that might affect the whole year. Do you remember that? It was a very interesting way of looking at things. And whether they could afford it or not, it was really important for them to um, make a big spread and spend a lot of money and buy gifts that they couldn't afford perhaps because if you act in this way, it shows that you are going to be provisioned during the year. Right, prosperous, exactly. So that was interesting to me. And then I guess my last remembrance, if I will, on this tape would be to say that um, they have a tradition of the, um, before the night of Sagansar, or the special night, the first one, they go to the Lama, and the Lama, they call him the Lam, um, actually gives them a particular course of walking out of the house that each one of them needs to follow. It's different for each person because to them, the way you walk on the first day of the year is exceedingly important, and so you need to get it right. And so he might say you need to go out the door and take three steps left, and then four steps forward, and one step sideways, or whatever such as that. Well, you know, um, deep in my spirit, I was just moved by the concept of it's important how you walk. And of course, for believers in um, the Lord, you believe very much that it depends upon how you walk as far as the quality of your life and the honoring or dishonoring of um, your Lord. And so even though they didn't do exactly the same uh, didn't have the same motivation of heart. It was like a ritual of how many steps, but there was a grain of an idea there. And I remember um, the writer Richardson, who had talked to Don Richardson, who had talked about um, oh eternity in their hearts, and uh, he had some other books too. That talked about these kinds of. Um, ideas that filter into cultures that really do have some roots that you can um, maybe talk about and understand and then maybe even deepen with what it is that you've come to know. So um, it was a blessing to be there. I learned as much from them as they learned from me, maybe probably more. And um, it's just um, been a great experience to be a part of our Mongolia. Thank you so much.